Peter Pan is a classic, and it, as soon as I started watching the movie again, you hear the songs and you, you get transported back to your childhood. But something that really fascinated me, which I didn't know, was that um, not only did you provide the voice, but you acted it out for the animator. Is that correct? Yes, I had that opportunity to do that, yes. I went in to do the recordings, and then afterwards they were saying that they wanted me to go um, on, you know, onto the stage and then uh, perform the movements for these various different scenes. And that was to help the animators to see how the body was moving and to make them make the character look more realistic. Right. So we had the two sessions. We had the recording session and then a little while later we did the live action session. That's amazing. Yeah. Now I also saw that uh, when there would be either a dispute or or a way that something needed to be done, maybe Mindy, you could speak to this a little bit, that Walt would be would come down and they were like, well, don't bother him, he might have been busy, but he was totally immersed in, into doing this, is that correct? Yep, very much so. Um, even beyond coming to the set at night, he would go around the halls and, <laughs> and make sure, keeping an eye on the artwork, seeing how things were progressing. But yeah, Kathy, I think yeah. you probably have a few moments that you might recall where Walt came around. Oh, and yes, and, and it was amazing how he's the head of the studio. Right. And I remember they were having a, a discussion about one of the scenes. I don't remember which one it was. It was the live action, in the live action. And um, the, the, the directors were sort of vying about, well, how do we want to do it this way? Well, should we do it that way? Well, why don't we just call Walt and ask him to come down and see what he thinks? <laughs> so they called Walt, and he was down in a few minutes. Wow. He just says, okay, what's the matter, boys? What do you want? And so the t it was discussed, and we tested it out, and he said, well, you know what? It's, it's, you were doing it the right way the first time. Oh, wow. <laughs> That, that's, so that was the way it was. That's really interesting to me. Now, working with Walt so directly, was there anything that you picked up from him? Because obviously, he's he's a visionary. Yes. A futurist, even. Um, was was there anything that you picked up just by being around him? The fact that that he was hands on. I think that was the big thing. In, as a child, what I was looking at, and realizing that this person was so so talented and of course I admired him so much because of all the things that I had seen you know before I had the opportunity to play Alice sure. and then play, play, play Wendy and Peter Pan and uh, it was just a lovely experience to get to know him personally and the fact that he was so hands-on you know I expected him to be the head of the studio you probably, probably wouldn't see him sure. very often hardly at all because it was all the directors and everybody else it wasn't he was he would run if there was a question he would run down to help answer the question. Well, okay, boys, let me hear it and see what uh, I'll give you what I think. That's amazing. <laughs> but it was very much a team effort, sure. and I realized this is a team working together. That was the important thing that I took Absolutely. from that experience. Now, uh, something that I realized watching this back, which you don't pick up on as a kid, is how sassy Tinkerbell is and how ahead of her ahead of her time she is. Right? <laughs> yep. She's um, she's a feminist. She's she's very. She, she's not like anything that had come before her. So can you talk to me a little bit about Tinkerbell? Sure. This was a very um, challenging character. She had been, if you recall from the stage production, just a flash of light and nothing more cantankerous even as that. But Walt realized if he was going to transform this story for animation, which it was perfectly suited right. for, suddenly you didn't have to have strings for flying and, and you could have a real dog, instead of a person in a costume. Oops, didn't mean to give anything away. <laughs> but the character Tinkerbell presented a pretty unique problem because, in fact, she had not been embodied. And everyone's imagination has a different interpretation of, of just exactly what a little fairy might be. And so while pursuing this story and exploring what was possible, it was about a 15-year um, oh, evolution wow. to this character. Walt started as early as the mid-1930s right, in right. production and exploring possibilities. He put a woman by the name of Dorothy Ann Blank on the task of looking at this story, seeing what was possible, and it was Dorothy. They were exploring with dialogue and different looks and changing her costumes for Tinkerbell. But it was Dorothy who said, you know, I think we're missing, we have an opportunity here to play within this world of imagination and give her just simply the voice of bells. 
So at the earliest explorations, the very first Tinkerbell that we see, she looks awfully like the Blue Fairy, right. kind of a, just oh. a small, tiny little pin-sized Blue Fairy, because Walt was in production on Pinocchio, and he liked where they were going with that particular fairy. So they started there, but as time went on, mm -hmm. hairstyles changed, yeah. clothing styles changed, we have the war, World War II right. comes along, the film has to be shelved, bringing it back, building the studio back up to be able to tell the story in the way it deserved to be told. Are the artists there? How do we get this shape? Do we have the talent for it? So it took time, and Walt wasn't about to pursue anything if it wasn't going to be absolutely right. Right. And in fact, that's why it took that long. Mark Davis, one of the great nine old men of Walt Disney's animation, was given the task of defining this character. And what's interesting is he took all of these early explorations and took elements from that and then went to the ink and paint department. There was a young girl there by the name of Ginny Mack who was a wonderful artist and inker and had an extensive career with the animation department at Disney. And she was a little blonde who wore her <laughs> hair in a bun and had little bangs to the side. And so they asked her one day if she would pose for a pixie. So a couple of times she went out with the artists and Mark Davis and the directors and they would have her look certain ways. And thus began the beginning. That was, it was Ginny Mack who was the original model for Tinkerbell wow. as the suggested uh, movements and ideas. And that form, that final form of her, was also then something that Kathy got involved with. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, because um, Tinkerbell embodied the youth and then, and then the adult, and they needed, they were trying to find the, the right mix. Yeah. So they did have me do a scene, because uh, I was there already working with the other characters that I was doing, uh, just to see how it played out, you know. So it was just that. <laughs> Nothing ever really developed from it, but, uh, but I did well, do a couple of scenes I as think Tinkerbell. There are elements in there. <laughs> yes, because yes. you have her as a, Mark Davis had designed her to be this complex blend of a little girl from the waist up and a woman right. from the waist down. Right. So we see there were a number of, of models, mm -hmm. Ginny Mack and Kathy, mm -hmm. Helene Stanley, Helene Stanley right. who had been doing quite a bit for Cinderella and mm -hmm. live action reference on Sleeping Beauty and other yeah. things later. And Margaret Carey and a couple of other ladies were brought in as well because they were exploring this complex blend. So yeah. it's a pretty fascinating side of the story. Yes. <laughs>